Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us, us this evening for our presentation, Merry Gardens for Mother's Day, a DIY windowsill display. This event has been offered by the Marion Library and the University of Dayton Alumni Association. My name is Melanie Fields, and I'm an alumni from the class of 2018. I was recently married, however, so if I do look a little familiar, you may recognize me as Melanie Zabrowski. Um, just a note that we are recording today's session and we'll plan on uploading it to you digital in about a week or so in case you miss something or want to share it with friends and family. We are using the question and answer box, so if you have any questions, feel free to submit them at any time and we'll try our best to answer these at the end of the presentation. Um, so while people are filtering in, I'll give a little bit more of what we're going to be talking about this evening. During this presentation, we're going to be sharing some of the history of the Mary's Gardens movement and showcasing some items from the John Stokes and Mary's Gardens archival collection. Then we'll go into some more details about dish gardens in general, and I'll show you some of my examples that I've created, and I'll walk you through my creative process. At the end of the presentation, we'll be doing the live terrarium demonstration, so stay tuned for that. A little bit more about me. Um, I started at the Marion Library in 2015 as a student worker, and then I was hired full time a few months after I graduated as a library specialist. Um, so actually, I've been working with the collections here about six years now, and it's pretty crazy how quickly time has gone. One of my absolute favorite collections in the Marion Library is the Mary's Gardens collection, and I'm excited to share a bit about it with you this evening. Um, I grew up in a family of gardeners, so this collection is really close to my heart. My degree from UD is in visual arts with a focus on installation art, but what I really come to love post-graduation is biophilic design. Biophilia is a term that literally means love for nature, and it's a type of design ethos that tries to incorporate more of the natural world into our built environments. So it's really a passion for me to learn how to bring nature indoors, and I think the dish gardens are a great example of that. My husband and I moved into a new house last fall, and a sunroom was a must on our wish list because I probably have about 50 house plants at this point. Um, taking care of all these plants is definitely a commitment. Um, but I really love it because they bring me a lot of joy and a sense of peace in my home. And it's really easy to see how gardening can translate into a spiritual practice and help us connect us to our faiths as well. Um, so my hope for today's webinar is to inspire you to create your own Mary garden, however simple or complex this may be, whether you're a beginner or an expert. Um, and it was cool for me during my research to find out that many of the Marian house plants I already own are considered Marian plants and that there's a lot of native species that you can find in your own backyard. So there's hundreds of Marian flowers out there and we're hoping you won't be too overwhelmed. So that's why we shared our list of 45 plants to get you started. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my coworker, Kayla Harris now, who's gonna explain some more about the Mary's Gardens movement. Hi everyone, I'm Kayla Harris and I've been the archivist in the Marion Library for about five years. Personally, I'm a terrible gardener, uh, but I do have an interest in the topic. I previously worked at the Turfgrass Information Center at Michigan State University and completed an internship with the Archives of American Gardens at the Smithsonian. I've enjoyed getting to use that background while working with the John Stokes and Mary Garden Collection here in the Marion Library. This collection is our most widely used archival collection, and it attracts researchers from all over the world, as well as being used by instructors here at UD from a variety of disciplines. So what is a Mary Garden? Brother Sean McNamara explains, a Mary Garden is simply a garden composed of plants dedicated to Mary, the mother of Jesus, having her statue as the focal point of the garden. It may be large or small, indoor or outdoor. It is a garden of love and beauty, sharing plants with others for teaching others, especially children. And this image here on the screen is actually the Mary Garden that was included in Resch Library during our exhibit in spring of 2017. 
The Virgin Mary has long been associated with many different varieties of flowers and is often depicted in artwork with them, such as this 15th century piece featuring Mary and the infant Jesus in an enclosed garden space by an unknown artist. The tradition of Mary gardens really dates back to English monasteries in the Middle Ages, at a time when flowers were used as a means of visual storytelling throughout the countryside. Known as Mary's England, the nation was particularly devoted to the Virgin Mary. Flowers had names that were used to tell stories of Mary's life and virtues. Though, before Christianity, flowers were used in a similar way for other deities. For example, there were several flowers that were once associated with the Norse goddess Freya or the Roman goddess Venus that then in turn became associated with the Virgin Mary. When the Reformation began in the 16th century, these Marian plant names were lost as it was seen as a form of idolatry. So for example, a flower name like Gloves of Mary became Foxgloves. You will have seen some other common examples in the handout we provided when you registered. And Melanie will go into a little more detail about the legends and stories behind a few particular examples. So a Mary garden then is really just a garden that is intentionally planted with flowers or plants with a particular Marian connection. This is actually not too difficult in fact, because as Melanie said, there are hundreds of these early Marian names. Though they began in English monasteries, John S. Stokes Jr. and his business partner, Edward McTeague, are responsible for spreading this tradition in the United States through a multifaceted organization that they named Mary's Gardens. The first Mary Garden in the United States was at St. Joseph's Parish in Woods Hole, Massachusetts, created by Francis Crane Lilly. In 1929, Francis, a parishioner of St. Joseph's, gifted the parish two large stone bell towers and later developed a garden dedicated to Our Lady on the tower grounds. She had previously visited England and learned of the tradition there and felt inspired to recreate these beautiful gardens locally. Francis's husband, Frank, worked across the bay from St. Joseph's Parish at the Marine Biology Laboratory and they had a pretty interesting relationship with their blended passion for science and religion. And what I like to imagine as kind of a humorous wife gesture, Frances wanted the bell towers and garden to be visible to her husband and the other scientists working at the lab. She explained, it was to remind the scientists who study at the marine biology laboratory across the street there is another and valid aspect of life. The garden at Woods Hole was described in a magazine article where the author stated about Mrs. Lilly. And brightly, the lady looked forward to a day when the right man would turn up, a gardener who would make it the passion of his life to choir Our Lady's glories and blossoms. In 1951, John S. Stokes Jr., a former Quaker who had what he called a lightning bolt conversion to Catholicism in his family's garden, read this particular article. And like a scene out of a movie, he is said to have been moved to tears knowing that he was going to be the man to champion this cause. John Stokes was a really fascinating man. An engineer, he shifted his life's work with the creation of the Mary's Garden nonprofit organization. Stokes and his co-founder, along with numerous associates through the years, advanced the movement in several different ways. First, they conducted extensive research with botanists, folklorists, and lexicographers working to resurrect these lost Marian plant names. Many of the lists that Stokes compiled through this research include a Marian name, a botanical or scientific name, and a common name. Some of these lists, such as the abbreviated version that we sent you upon registration, are categorized by type. So for example, we also have lists such as 200 flower shrubs and trees for sunny Mary gardens, or tropical plants with religious names, 
They wanted to make it as easy as possible for anyone with an interest to be able to quickly get started. Even poor gardeners like myself could follow the simple lists and gardening guides that the organization produced. Mary Gardens also sold seed packets for a time, allowing individuals to write in and request specific plant varieties. Stokes and others traveled across the country, presenting at gardening shows and events, including at least one here at the University of Dayton, to bring these flowers back into popularity and provide the necessary resources for individuals, parishes, schools, and communities to create their own married gardens. In 2007, John Stokes passed away and his children arranged for the transfer of his extensive collection of materials to the Marion Library. The physical collection is over 100 boxes, including research notes, photographs, video recordings, articles, gardening guides, along with many other tangentially related materials that Stokes collected. So a lot of those types of materials document the changing nature of American Catholicism in the 20th century and focus on topics such as ecumenical dialogue, civil rights, fair housing practices, and other social justice issues. In the early 90s, Mary's Gardens went online. Stokes used the internet and technology to introduce new audiences to the movement. His original website even encouraged users to create their own virtual Mary Gardens using a software program that's seen here. In addition to the physical materials, his highly popular website, mgardens.org, was transferred to the Marian Library so that it could, could continue to be shared with anyone from beginning gardeners to experts. Although the format is slightly updated, the content is his original work and research and is both browsable and searchable at go.udayton.edu slash Mary's Gardens. And now I will turn it back to Melanie. All right. So now that you have a better idea of what a Mary Garden is, we thought it would be nice to give you a glimpse of some of the flower legends associated with Mary. Many times these are in relation to her life or in honor of her qualities or virtues that she expresses. Knowing these legends and flower symbols can help inspire deeper devotion in your own faith life. So this image featured here is a book cover and it's for Mary's Flowers, Gardens, Legends and Meditations by Vincentina Cremau. Published in 2002, it's a really great resource for Mary gardeners and actually includes the foreword written by John Stokes himself. Stokes really encouraged Krumau to write the book and she spent a lot of time here in the Marian Library learning more. A longtime volunteer here, she also helped us with the original Stokes website migration and eventually her own archives were donated to us after her passing in 2015. This archive is currently being processed but it will be a wonderful addition to our collection soon. So the book itself is full of really great information on all things Mary Garden, and it's still available for purchase on Amazon, I believe. Uh, the flower artwork you see here, um, these were all created by brother Joseph Barish, a Marianist brother, and he illustrated the 30 Marian flowers that are featured in the book. I'll be using these images throughout my next few slides as well. So probably one of the best places to start is in Mary's life with the, is with the Annunciation. Um, this is when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary telling her that she had found favor with God and that she would conceive and bear a son named Jesus. Um, if you were raised Catholic, you probably know this story pretty well, but there are a lot of flower, flower legends that help embellish it a little bit more. So this painting is titled The Annunciation to Mary, Lily and Violet, and it's by a Cincinnati-based artist named Holly Schapker. Schapker was commissioned by the Marian Library in 2017 to paint a series on Marian flower legends, and we have about 24 of her original oil on canvas works in our collection. I'll be using these in the next few slides as well, just so you know the artist behind them. So in the painting itself, you can see the angel Gabriel holding a lily flower, and this is in recognition of Mary's purity. 
Certain traditions say that after Mary touched the flower, which had orig originally been scentless, an exquisite fragrance arose from it. It's also said that violets bloomed outside her window when she spoke the phrase, here I am the servant of the Lord. So for this reason, violets have come to symbolize Mary's humility or Mary's modesty, and the lily symbolizes her purity. Another important event in the life of Mary is her long journey to see her cousin Elizabeth. This painting is titled The Visitation of Mary and Elizabeth Columbine, and it pays homage to this tiny flower that is said to have sprung up wherever Mary's feet touched the ground on her journey. Symbolic of Mary's shoes, it also came to represent Pentecost because if you've ever seen a Columbine, its petals kind of resemble the tiny tongues of flame of the Holy Spirit. And so for this reason, it's also referred to as the Holy Ghost flower. Um, we could probably spend an entire hour alone just talking about Marian flower legends. Uh, so just be aware that this is very, just a very brief glimpse of what is out there. Another thing to note, like you've seen in this slide and especially in the following slides, is that one flower can have multiple meanings and also multiple flowers can share the same meanings in certain legends. Because these dead legends date back sometimes a thousand years or more and that many of them were passed down through oral traditions, there's not an easy way to know what was the correct flower for what legend. Um, so there's no way to really prove one being right over another. So this last slide deals with two of my personally favorite smelling herbs, lavender and rosemary. Both of these legends pertain to the Holy Family's journey during the flight to Egypt, and they share some similar symbolism. The first painting is titled, Blossoms Mark the Road They Trod, Rosemary and German Their Speedwell. Rosemary is known as Mary's bouquet, and it's also said that the rosemary bush gave shelter to the Holy Family during their flight to Egypt. A couple other flower legends, flowers that share this legend are the clematis and the juniper bush. Another legend about rosemary says that once when Mary was drying her cloak, she spread it over the bush and the flowers changed from white to blue in her honor. The other flower featured in this painting is German der Speedwell, and this is known as Our Lady's Resting Place after a legend that said its blossoms mark each place she rested on the flight to Egypt. So the second painting here is titled A Cushion for the Baby and a Lavender Bush for the Mother, Sea Pink and Lavender. And lavender is known as Mary's drying plant. A certain legend says that once when Mary was washing Jesus's clothes and put them on a place to dry, um, the godly fragrance that came off of, her off of Jesus's clothes were transferred to the plant and that's what gave it its wonderful smell. The other flower featured here, the sea pink blossom, um, these are shaped like miniature cushions, and it's said that they also formed a place for Mary and Jesus to sit during their rest on the flight to Egypt. For this reason, it's also known as Our Lady's Cushion. So central to John Stokes' work with Mary Gardens was that other interested individuals would also take up this mission as their own. And one such gardener, Bonnie Roberson of Hagerman, Idaho, is particularly important to the story. Bonnie was an avid gardener who stumbled across information on Mary's gardens and created one in her own backyard. However, she felt a desire to make Mary gardens more accessible to certain groups of people, such as the elderly, those with disabilities, and people who were blind in particular. This is how the idea for Mary Dish Gardens began. Though not always ideal for long-term plant survival, plants do like to be outside in the ground, dish gardens could be mobile and more easily shared with others. Bonnie also used Mary Dish Gardens to encourage others to use their senses beyond just sight. How did the plants smell? What do they feel like? How could these attributes be used to tell stories about Mary's virtues and life? So now I'd like to share a few photographs in the collection of some of Bonnie's creation to provide further inspiration for when you create your own. 
So on the left is a handmade Mexican nativity scene in a thin white dish. And on the right is a merry garden featuring a small blue and white Madonna in a brandy snifter. So she was really creative in the types of containers that she used. Bonnie really enjoyed experimenting with creating unique settings. On the left is an example of creating a dish garden that rests underneath an ebony plaque of an African Madonna. So even without a statue, there are other ways that you can incorporate Mary in your garden. On the right is an example she created with a Japanese Madonna in a shallow dish. Then this dish garden features a statue of Our Lady of the Cape, a Marian title from Canada and features several Canadian plants. And then finally, this dish garden shows another one of those kind of unconventional containers using a kitchen saucepan along with a kitchen Madonna statue. And now I'll turn it back to Melanie who's gonna discuss how to plan your merry garden. So now that you've learned a little more about a, what a dish garden is, um, I'm gonna teach you how to make one. It helped with my own process to simplify things down into four aspects or elements. So even if you don't consider yourself an avid gardener, hopefully this won't be too intimidating to try. Um, these steps are also included in the handout we sent along with the list of the 45 plants. So the four elements of a container garden are the container itself, uh, the Marian item, which as you saw in the previous example, it doesn't have to be a statue if you want to get more creative. Uh, the third thing is the plants themselves. And then the fourth thing is the location you're planning to put your garden, just so you know what kind of lighting that place would receive. So this list isn't in any particular order, but it does highlight the interconnectedness of all of these elements. Um, for example, if you're planning on planting an herb garden, those need a lot of sun, so you would not want to plan to put that in a north facing window. Um, another thing would be if you got all through planting your garden and you love how it looks, but then you find out your statue just doesn't fit correctly. Um, these steps kind of just help you plan it out beforehand so your garden can be the best that it can be. So for the containers, just remember that whatever you choose is going to house your plants. And when planning my own gardens, I wanted to get out everything that I had available that I could use to see what I would like best. Um, flower pots work really good, especially if they have drainage holes, because if you're choosing a container that is closed, um, that kind of does present a little more challenges, but those can be adapted too. Some of these teacups that you see here and the little candy dish in the back were all of my grandmother's, so I really something special. A good rule for containers is to try and choose something that's at least three inches deep, as this will allow more room for your roots to grow. Another thing is once you have your selection, just be sure to give it a good cleaning because you don't want any bacteria or things to grow. So just have a good fresh start for that container. So the next step in the process is to choose your Mary statue or other Marian themed object that would be proportionate to the container you've chosen. You could think about things like what titles, aspects, or other qualities of the Blessed Mother appear, appeal to you. Um, or to the person that you're making your garden for. I use statues that were readily available to me. So some of these are duplicates in the collection or other things that were donated just for this purpose. Um, but just know that there's about any kind of Mary statue out there that you can dream of. Whatever you choose, it's best to have a material that's either plastic, resin, or um, ceramic, just so that it won't deteriorate over time or have any water damage. Another option, if you're short on time and you don't have a statue, is to use a paper image that you could print from online. Or um, like in the example on the left, I used a duplicate postcard from our collection and I put it in a plastic frame to protect it from water. So this is just an example of a really quick Mary garden you can do. I thought the Mary's crown and the marigolds went together really nicely. 
So if you aren't too familiar with any of the plants on the list we shared, it's probably a good idea to just take a trip to your local nursery and see what's around. Um, I know the first time I learned about the Mary flowers in association with the regular flowers, when I went to the nursery, I was so surprised because I really saw Marian flowers everywhere. Um, so the ones you see on this list or on this slide are the ones I selected from the list we sent out. And these are ones that I had bought or already had available to use in my own gardens. I would say that if you're more of a beginner, start with a small selection, either one to three plants that have similar requirements, just so you're not too intimidated and you won't get disheartened if they happen to die pretty early on in your process. Um, it's a good idea when you're selecting your plants to just start small because the containers are already inherently small and you want them to live in there as long as possible. But if they do if you happen to outgrow it, you can always transplant them outside or divide them or whatever would work best. And I just wanted to put in a disclaimer that I am not an expert gardener. Um, I definitely have killed my fair share of plants, but it always helps me learn next time what I can do better. Like for example, the maiden hair frond that you see here, I've, I've killed probably three or four of these plants, but I've slowly learned over time what I need to do better. So actually I'm building one in the terrarium to give myself another chance to keep it alive. So the majority of the plants on the list we shared do require a lot of sun to survive. That's why if you're planning a flower or herb garden, I definitely recommend setting it in a south facing window or another window that receives at least four to five hours of direct sunlight a day. If you don't have a place inside your home like this, there's definitely no harm in placing your container garden outside. Um, you could consider an outdoor window box or even just some plants on your patio with a Mary statue in between. I know um, I've had herbs like rosemary and sage and I've brought them inside for the winter so that they'll survive. But as soon as the weather gets nice, I'll bring them out because that's really where they want to be. But if you're really intent on having an indoor Mary garden, I definitely recommend selecting from the list of Mary and house plants um, because these plants are much more suited to an indoor environment and can adapt to a lot more shade. I've been able to keep many of my house plants alive for years just because I know the best place to put them and their watering schedules because that's really the most important part. It may be tri tricky to get the watering schedules right at first and the amount of water you're using, especially if your container doesn't have drainage. Um, but we'll get into that later about why the gravel at the bottom can be particular, particularly important. So the first garden I'm gonna share with you today is the Marion Herb Garden I created. And this one was a lot of fun to make because I knew I wanted something with a lot of UD flair because this is a garden that we were gonna use in our promotion for the event. Um, so whether you're planning to plant an herb garden or something else, many of the basic steps of the container gardens are the same. So I'm going to walk you through a little bit more of my process for this one. Ideally, there are three layers of material for any non-draining container garden. And the first layer is the gravel, or like you see in this picture, I use some larger stones instead. Um, and the next layer is really important as a buffer layer between the gravel and the soil so that they don't drain through. And it's definitely a protective layer um, to regulate the drainage in these closed containers. Because actually um, what a lot of beginners make mistakes is when they overwater their plants because that can be just as deathly to plants as underwatering them. So these bottom layers help to minimize that risk for sure. Um, here you can see for my middle layer, I use some coconut husk, but other materials like moss or even plastic with some holes punched in it work fine as well. So I researched a bunch of herbs that would work well in an indoor Mary garden. And I decided on the four plants you see here, the rosemary, the thyme, the spearmint, and the strawberry. And all of these except the strawberry can definitely handle a little less sun. But I thought it was too cute to leave out just because the red and blue matched so well. Um, so I probably will transplant the strawberry outside when the weather gets a little warmer. Um, before you go about planting your garden, you want to just take a few moments to organize the layout of your plants 
so that when you plant them, you're not shifting them around more than you need to. So that'll stop their roots from getting broken. Um, since the container I used here was somewhat shallow, I made sure to remove some of the soil when I pulled the plant out of the pot and I bunched the roots together so that they would lay more horizontally than deep, just so it would lay nicely in the container. Um, so this next example is a flower garden I created. And I really wanted to use some of the violets that were growing in my backyard because they're just everywhere. And I wanted to see if they would do well indoors. So the teacups you see were also my grandmother's. And I really wanted to do this example to show you that a Mary Garden doesn't have to be expensive. Um, everything here I found in my backyard, I found in my home. So it really didn't cost me anything to make. This statue I used here is really interesting. Um, this is Our Lady of Cabejo. And this is an apparition of Mary that appeared in Rwanda um, during the 1980s. And she will be added to our collection after this presentation. <laughs> so for this particular setting, I gathered all of these plants from my backyard and made sure to select violets, especially that were growing in the shade already, so that when I moved them indoors, it wouldn't be too traumatizing because the lighting requirements were pretty similar. And I also collected moss, even though it's not quite a Marian plant, I thought it would add to the container. So don't be afraid if you have another plant you wanna use and it's not particularly Marian, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt to add it. Uh, you can see that I filled the bottom of the containers with a little bit of gravel, um, but I decided to not do the, the drainage layer just because the containers were already so tiny. Um, but then I was able to put some soil and put the violets in there. And I added the moss on top just to add a little bit of a barrier for um, the water. And I've had this garden for about two weeks now, and I probably missed it about every other day just so the moss keeps the plant. Uh, wet. And so far the violets seem to be adjusting pretty well, so it seems to be successful. So this last example is a house plant example, and it's something I actually already had planted, but when I realized that both the plants here are considered Marian house plants, I decided to add the statue to really make it a true Mary dish garden. The fern is a plumosa fern, which is also known as Mary's hair. And then the purpley vine I have here is a variation of the spiderwort plant. And these are really cool plants. They come in all different varieties and colors, and they can propagate really easily if you cut off their edges and stick them in water. And all of these in the picture actually came from propagations from a larger plant. Um, the pieta and the Mary's Tears plant, they really can show that you can choose gardens based on themes. So this would be like a sorrow for mother theme. Um, that was the only theme I did, but there are lots of connections you can make within the religious symbolisms of the plants. So just a reminder, if you have questions as we're going through, go ahead and submit them through the Q&A and we'll get, we'll try to answer as many as we can at the end. Right now, Melanie is getting set up for the terrarium tutorial, but I can help walk you through some of the preliminary steps. Um, you received a handout in advance that kind of walked you through these steps as well. Um, but the process is relatively simple. So even if you fall a little behind, don't worry, um, the steps are easy and you've got those written instructions that you can use as well. Um, you'll all, and then you'll also be able to watch the recording. You're gonna wanna have your glass container washed and cleaned and have all your materials handy. Melanie pre-made the plastic sheeting layer by tracing the container to the, by tracing the container and cutting the plastic to the proper size. She punched holes into this plastic using a pen so that the water is able to drain through, but not to the soil. So now I will turn it over to Melanie, who is just finishing getting set up and is going to demonstrate the next steps. So Kayla explained a little bit of the preliminary steps, but I'm just gonna do these pretty quickly as well. So you do wanna start with a pre-cleaned container. 
and you want to add about an inch of gravel to the bottom of that. And just flatten it out so that your second layer can sit nicely. So like Kayla said, I just used a piece of plastic sheeting that I traced the container on and then I punched little holes in it so that the water can drain. And you just gently set that down inside. So then I have some soil here and I'm gonna do about half the soil first before I put the plant in. I'm actually gonna dump it because that will be a lot quicker. So I'm just gonna smooth it around and kind of make a little divot where I do want my plant to go. Uh, you're welcome to center this in the middle or if you have a larger statue and you want that to be in the center, uh, just put your plant off a little to the side. So I'm gonna pull my plumosa fern out. And I'm gonna take a little bit of the soil off the bottom um, and then I'm gonna flatten it. I don't know if you can see that pretty well, just so that it doesn't stick up too much in my container. Um, so then I'm gonna finish filling it with soil so that the top of the plant space is even with the rest of the soil. And if you have decorations, you can definitely add these afterwards. For my first terrarium I made, I added some moss to it and some and rocks, um, but I'm not going to do that for this one just because of our time. So once the soil is all planted or all uh, evened out, you can add your Mary statue or your decorations. Um, what I wanted to do was I didn't want to stick a Mary statue directly in the dirt. So I got a little bit of a river stone that she can sit on. And I'll place that in there. And then I did forget a napkin. So my hands are extremely muddy. Um, but I'm going to turn this around so that you can see it. And this is just a very, very basic Marian terrarium that you can definitely extend, expend upon. Um, like I said, my original example, I used a maiden hair fern, and this one has um, some moss and some stones in it. And Kayla can cut back to that other slide so that you can see a better image. Okay, so yeah, here on the slide, thank you for that demonstration, Melanie. Um, here on the slide, you can see that kind of up close image that Melanie took of her creation that she made in advance of the event, um, showing kind of her steps and then here the terrarium where it is all put together. And I see a question there that can I use a cutout Ziploc bag? And yes, that is actually a perfect a perfect example as long as it's big enough for your the base of your terrarium because primarily that is to prevent the water um, so if it's a square ziploc bag in like a circular container the water will still get through on the side so you'll want to make sure it does fit correctly and um, I see another question for potting soil um, I used miracle grow potting soil that you can get anywhere um, specifically for indoor terrariums, sometimes people recommend adding some peat moss to the mixture, um, but I found either way works successfully as long as you keep it moist inside. So 
for those of you who kind of followed along with these simple steps that we did or might do so later, or even if you already had a Mary Garden, we would love to see your designs. Please consider sharing your designs with us by email at marionlibrary at udayton.edu. And so now I'm going to stop sharing our slides and um, we're, go we're happy to take additional questions. I think there's one other that's just come in, um, but if you have others, please go ahead and send them through the Q&A function. Okay, so the next question, in addition to those questions that Melanie um, already answered about the Ziploc bag and the potting soil is we have, do you have gardens on view in the Marion Library comparable at times to the standing exhibit of creches? So that is a great question. Um, unfortunately, we do not right now um, have any indoor gardens. The garden that I showed in one of the earlier slides in Resch Library in 2017 was actually really perfect timing. The library underwent a renovation shortly after that. So it was kind of the perfect time to have dirt and mud and those sort of things that don't normally come indoors inside. So that was featured on the first floor. Um, but other than that, right now we do not have any standing um, Mary Gardens. I can add to that a little bit that um, in Vincentina's Cremau's archival collection, she did a lot of research about local Mary Gardens and there's actually a lot on UD's campus already. Um, if you are familiar, Serenity Pines has a few plaques of Mary statues, or not statues, but like the little placards of what the plants mean. And then at one point there was a volunteer crew who would come to the chapel courtyard and uh, replant that every year, but I'm not sure if that still is active, although there are still like rose plants growing in that area. Um, so the next question, is there any special trick to the terrarium to get the reflection of the base? Um, I'm not quite sure what you might mean by that question, but I know when we were trying to show it on the screen, the problem is it's so reflective to lighting in the room that it is pretty hard to show. Um, so I'm not sure, sure what exactly that question means if you want to specify a little bit more. Um, someone asked on suggestions on where to buy Mary statues. So um, as Melanie said, you know, she was kind of fortunate in that we have some maybe excess duplicated ones that are not officially part of our collection. We wouldn't use collection items in these, in these gardens. Um, but there are many Catholic supply stores. Um, we even just usually do like, you can do a simple Google search for Catholic supply stores wherever you're located at, because we know some of you are joining us from beyond Dayton. Um, the next question, uh, this I think would be for you, Melanie, what is the largest Mary garden that you have made? So I've only stuck to container gardens so far, and the largest one would probably be the herb garden that you saw. That was probably about 10 to 12 inches. Um, the problem with container gardens is you do have to carry them. So the larger you make it, the heavier it does get. Um, like I said earlier, I did just move into our first home. So I finally have a garden outside of my own. So I may try to make some more Mary Gardens this year. And then we have a question. Do you add charcoal at the bottom? I have often heard that terrariums need that. So I have seen that as well, that the charcoal helps um, helps with like the mold and other kind of bacteria and things that can grow. So I would say, yes, if you have charcoal, definitely add it. Um, it was just for this specific tutorial. We wanted to keep things as simple as possible so that you could find things in your own home to use. But there are a lot of tricks. If you really want to make a really cool terrarium with some more of the Marion flowers listed, um, there are a lot of good just regular uh, terrarium tutorials online that you can follow that list some more layers if you would like a more advanced terrarium. Okay, and then we have someone sent, um, are there any Mary Gardens in the Dayton area that individuals can visit? Um, and I know, um, in addition to the one that Melanie described uh, on campus that 
uh, there's a few kind of spots. There's also a Mary Garden at NACMIS, the North American Center for Marianist Studies, and that's over in Beaver Creek. Um, they have some beautiful, wonderful grounds uh, where they have these Mary Gardens. So I don't know if, if you happen to know any others, Melanie, but that's a really great one that I would recommend uh, checking out. And that's also the Bergamo Retreat Center, right? That's where yes. that is. I know um, also in Vincenzina's archives, she had some local parish gardens, um, but I haven't explored those more deeply. I know specifically she mentioned, I think incarnation, um, but you could check your local parishes or even ask them. I knew I, I grew up and went to St. Helens and they always had a little grotto for Mary. So usually if it's not a full blown, full blown garden, you can find a little section that has some flowers in a Marian statue. Yeah, and that was really, you know, kind of important to that movement of like, it could be in people's backyards or, you know, once you learned about Mary Gardens, spreading the word and bringing it to your parish. So if you're, if you don't know of a Mary Garden existing where you are, you could be the person to create one and to start that tradition. Um, the next question asked, have you seen hostas listed in Stokes materials? So off the top of my head, I have not. Um, however, as we kind of talked about earlier, there are lists upon lists upon lists. So if you're still interested in finding out if hostas have a Marian name, please send us a follow-up email at marianlibrary at udayton.edu and we can spend a little bit more time um, going through those lists because there, you know, he has this research and kind of backs it up with his different um, citations of where he gets it from. So there might be a Marian name that, that are associated with them. And I was gonna say, even though, um, even though these aren't hostas, they are kind of similar and caladiums are also Marian plants. And depending on the color, they can mean different things. Like I know the white caladium is usually angel's wings and either the red or pink, one of the red ones is Jesus's heart and one of the pink ones is known as Mary's heart. Okay. Do either of you have a favorite plant or flower associated with Mary? I'll let Melanie answer that first since she's, you know, the gardener. Um, I recently bought a jasmine plant um, and even though it's really tiny right now, it is one of my favorite scents. And I'm hoping I can train the vine to grow in my sunroom. And so maybe in a couple years, it'll give off more blooms. So I would say that's probably my favorite plant just because of its smell and its ability to train it how you want it. I would say that mine um, is probably marigolds um, because they're pretty hard to kill in my experience. So those are one of the few plants that I I'm able to plant and you know um, keep them alive. And also, I just think uh, they're really kind of funny with the Marian name, Mary Gold, Mary's Gold, um, and that's one that's kind of easy to to remember that uh, Marian connection. Um, how about any special rock garden plants that might grow in the cracks of a grotto? Um, the first thing I thought of was on John Stokes planting list, he lists Kenilworth Ivy. And I looked that plant up, but I haven't been able to find it in any nurseries or anything. But what I saw online is that it's a pretty robust plant and it can grow in a lot of places. So it depends on if your grotto is like full blazing sun or if it's in a shaded area, I think. There are some cacti and other um, southwestern plants that are also considered Marian plants. So this question, um, how do individuals visit the Marian Library to learn more about the Mary Garden collection? So there's a couple of different things. Um, as we shared on that link earlier, go.udayton.edu slash Mary's Gardens, that will take you to Stokes's um, original content from his website. And that's something that anyone can access anytime. We're also planning on sending um, a follow-up email that has kind of a compiled list of resources that will include some of Stokes's materials that we have digitized and we host in our institutional repository eCommons. 
So that's another great way to kind of access these materials remotely. Right now, um, the Marion Library is open by appointment only due to COVID. Um, we're hopeful that potentially in the fall, those restrictions will change. So I would just encourage you to either reach out to us via email or check our website to see kind of how, um, what, it, what the possibilities are for potentially visiting in person someday. And then, um, do you know if there's any connection between the Mary's Garden Movement and the May processions I remember in our Catholic grade schools in the 50s and 60s? So um, from what I know, um, as we kind of said earlier, I think in the presentation, the whole month of May is kind of this month that is often associated with Mary and devoted to Mary. Um, May processions often do involve flowers. So there is kind of a connectedness there. Um, and, you know, we're really popular, as you mentioned, kind of in the 50s and 60s. We had May, Day, May processions here at the University of Dayton. We have some great photos of, of those historical events happening. So I think um, even if it's not a, like, direct connection with the movements, I think the two are definitely interrelated in their popularity. And then this might be one for Melanie, but I think I know the answer. Um, is bleeding heart a Mary Garden plant? Uh, yeah, that actually is. I think you're thinking like the pink flowers with the little, the white drops. And yes, that is considered a Marian plant. And another um, similar to that is the, it's a, um, the begonia fuchsia. It kind of looks like that as well, but I think they both symbolize uh, the immaculate heart of Mary. Um, this question, which may maybe maybe our last question, we're getting close to the time, um, but we said that the Stokes collection is one of the most popular archival collections. What other collections do you enjoy working with? Do you want to answer that first, Melanie? Sure. Um, so my job as a library specialist is really cool because I get to work with all of the collections in the Marion Library. So. I get to work with the archival collection. I get to work with the rare books. I get to work with a lot of the artwork and nativity as well. Um, so each of those collections has their own pretty hidden gems within them. Um, but I would say one of my favorites is the rare books, especially um, I also run the Marion Library social media. So sometimes I'll just be browsing in the rare books room looking for really interesting things to share. And I'm always surprised by what I find. Speaking of our social media, um, if you don't already follow us, Melanie does post some really great images. We're on Instagram at Marion Library UD, as well as Twitter and Facebook. Um, and that also includes links uh, to blog posts that we do that highlight some of the unique items in the collection. So that's another great way to learn more about what's in the Marion Library. Um, and I would say as for my favorite collection, um, in addition, the Stokes collection is so wonderful because it does touch on so many different topics. It is really focused on Mary, but also covers these other areas. Um, but I don't know, I guess I don't, I don't have another favorite area of the collection because I think there are so many resources here that support our students in instruction, but can also just be used by the general public. And um, yeah. <laughs> So, so with that, um, I think we are about at time. So Melanie and I both want to say thank you again for joining us. Um, as Melanie mentioned at the beginning, the event has been recorded and the recording will be available in about a week. Keep an eye out for your email because as we mentioned earlier, we're going to share um, some links and resources as well as a really short survey about this program, about what you found helpful and what, what else you would like to know. So a thank you again to the University of Dayton Alumni Association for co-hosting this event, and we hope you have a wonderful evening. Go Flyers! <laughs>